Uh, thank you, Jed, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so we've now had a you know a great conversation, really, about um, speciesism at a you know the way that we uh, you know our mental processes and how the mental backflips that are involved in in humans being able to um, justify eating animals on the one hand and and loving others, and we've also learned more about the sort of philosophical processes that are involved and how the law has adapted and changed to facilitate that position. I might now just call our speakers back up. Um, we now have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you've got any questions, please raise your hand and Elaine will come around with a microphone. Anyone? Yep. A question for Jed. I think I've got you correct. You talked about under common law that women, slaves, etc., were property of men. Then you talked about the way that animals are seen in this way. And I got the sense that you were implying that therefore this is extra difficult to change or something. I mean, clearly this has changed in terms of seeing women, whatever. And I'm just curious, if, uh, as a non-lawyer, if you can explain to me why that's so difficult to change for animals within the law. I know perfectly well why it's difficult within psychology, but why is it so difficult in law? Yeah, and you and you probably your question probably came out of the fact that uh, I uh, you may have noticed I didn't propose a change to the property status of animals in my recommendations at the end there, and mm -hmm. I, I did think about that. Um, when, when I was um, uh, doing the, the presentation, I probably forgot to preface those recommendations with the fact that I could see them as being practical uh, within the short term future. Uh, long term, uh, there needs to be a change in the legal status of animals from property to something other than pure property. Um, it's, it's very difficult simply on the basis that it's it's been uh, that way uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years since the, the Western legal uh, tradition began. And it was only relatively recently, in relatively uh, historical times, that, uh, that women and the other uh, categories of people were taken out of the realm of, of property. So we're still uh, attempting to do that for animals now. I don't think, um, certainly in the common law world, that's going to happen any time soon. There could potentially be alterations to the property status. Uh, we have um, some leading scholars in the US proposing that there should be a, a category of, of living property or sentient property, um, which has different, different elements to it. Uh, but I, I think they're still a fairly long way off. To completely abolish the property status of animals, of course, would be um, you know, a huge revolution in the way the legal system deals with animals. Um, and it would probably lead to um, some form of, of animal rights, a recognition of, of rights, at least legal rights. And, uh, and that you know, may be the end long-term goal, but uh, in the short-term foreseeable future, um, the, there are some other practical reforms that can take place just to improve the, at least the consistency of the law and the way we, we treat animals and the way we, um, or at least the, the level of protection that we afford to different species of animal. But uh, no, it's, a, it's certainly a, a key occupation of animal lawyers is to consider how to reform the property status of animals. So it's, it's not something that uh, yeah, is, is forgotten, but it's very difficult. Um, I've got a question for Brock. I was wondering if an animal lives a life completely free of suffering, say um, most of our beef or cattle is raised on pasture um, and they don't suffer, they're not in factory farms um, and they die without any suffering, um, would you consider that reasonably ethical? Well, I mean, I'm not really, I guess, able to comment on whether it's... It, I, I mean, I guess maybe I would consider it more ethical. I guess the question is whether people would still be sort of um, put off by the fact that, you know, still their meat came from an animal. You know, would, would people still struggle with the fact if they had the cow heads sitting there while they were trying to eat their steak, would they still be able to feel just as inclined to enjoy that steak if the reminder of the, the, the living animal was there? I mean, of course, ethically, and, and I think it would be easier, obviously, for people if those sorts of issues around you know, harm were diminished. Absolutely, of course. Um, but I, I still think it's a psychological problem. I still, I still think people struggle with it, to be honest with you. Is it unrealistic to expect people to stop eating meat rather than... So would a more a better approach would be to say, let's just you know, support a system that is more ethical that would 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not sort of advocating for vegetarianism at all, in fact. But what I do want to sort of point out is what we do. And and I think if you don't if you don't think about what you do, if you don't know what you're doing, that's a problem. When you do things, you don't realise the sorts of processes that are involved, then you're blind to your own behaviour. And if 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 seeing that behaviour more clearly simply just means I'm going to think twice about how much I eat meat, then that's a good outcome too. It means it might reduce the consumption of meat. So I'm not advocating for a particular position, um, but I am highlighting you know, that, that there's psychological processes in here and that you know, anyone who eats meat goes through these processes. So, and, and I think we should know what they are. Um, sorry, I've got one more question. This question's for Jed. Um, so you said that there are some laws um, for animals, such as teeth clipping or, uh, say, crutching or muesling. Um, some of them are painful for the animals. So let's just take teeth clipping. But what you're doing by teeth clipping is reducing the chances that an animal, that piglet or pig will harm another animal, which would then cause disease and suffering. So in some ways, even though it seems inhumane to do this, it causes a small amount of suffering. It actually prevents a large amount of suffering in the, you know, down the track, disease. Potentially affects or prevents a large amount of suffering within the intensive animal confinement um, context. Um, I think we've got to be careful about um, justifying these sort of practices on the basis that they're necessary within that economic context. And even if they are necessary within that economic context, and I'm talking about industrial animal farming, then why not use forms of pain relief to reduce the amount of pain? Um, it, it's all about you know, as I said earlier, using the quote from Bernie Rowland, pushing square pegs through round holes and trying to do it in the most efficient, economically efficient way possible, uh, where animals are really bearing the, the burden um, of, our, of our efficiency through their own pain and suffering. So I think it's you know, really time that we started to invest more in uh, animal welfare input costs to, to either be able to avoid those sort of practices or at, at the very least reduce the pain and suffering caused to, to animals in the process. I wonder if I could say something about your earlier question from an ethical perspective rather than from a psychological point of view. Uh, and I think if you look at what philosophers have had to say about what we should focus on when we're analysing the acceptability of different times of uh, kinds of treatment of animals from an ethical point of view, uh, you can see that people focus on different things and what you focus on depends, you know, has consequences for what you would say about a case like the one you raised. So a lot of people would focus on suffering and if you think that suffering is the most ethically significant thing in how we treat animals, uh, then it makes a difference if you can uh, come to a situation where animals are raised perhaps for meat production without suffering being involved. Uh, but there are other things that might be relevant. So some people would want to focus on the killing of animals as something that might be ethically problematic in its own right. Uh, other people would take a more radical perspective and they would want to focus on the use of animals, uh, the very act of owning and using animals as something that might be problematic. Uh, so my own view would be that uh, emphasis is properly placed on suffering. Uh, and so my answer to your question would be that it does make a big difference uh, how the animal is raised. Uh, but what view you take depends upon what you're focusing on. I have a question for Professor Crow as well. If you argue that it's unethical to limit the neighbour principle, um, place any kind of limits on it, do you agree with deep ecologists and other environmental philosophers that we need to extend or incorporate the entire ecology into our moral world? That's a very interesting question. And I can't say I've got a, myself a well worked out view on that issue. Uh, of course, when you're talking about the um, extension of the neighbour principle and raising this issue, who is our neighbour, uh, you need to address seriously this question of um, whether different types of entities other than sentient creatures can have some sort of ethical status. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to stop thinking about the categories that we generally use to uh, examine these issues, things like suffering and so on and think about whether other sorts of attributes uh, which the natural world possesses, for example, uh, could be criteria for ethical consideration. Uh, my own uh, starting point is to be a bit skeptical of that further extension beyond animals to giving the natural world ethical status in its own right. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that that scepticism comes in part from the way that we as humans have been uh, taught to focus on ourselves 
uh, as exemplars of what it means to be an ethical being. Uh, so it's worthwhile to take these questions seriously and ask whether we should be more creative in thinking about those issues. Uh, my question's for Brock. Um, we know that animals have different degrees of, of cognition and, and probably different degrees of um, suffering that they can experience. Um, this probably even includes insects and, and how much pain they can experience. Uh, do you think our treatment of them should be based on this degree of amount of suffering that they can experience, so we should have different moral codes for different types of animals and, and organisms? Um, I don't actually want to, I feel like I shouldn't be answering that question. It seems like it's more of a legal question. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know if we should. I, I think that harm is one of the sort of basic moral principles. You know, if, if something can be harmed or if something is harmed, that's when we start to think about, in fact, the concept of harm pretty much underlies a lot of what people think is anything to do with morality in, in, in general. So, if, you know, the, the extent of harm that an animal can actually experience I suppose is what makes us feel bad or, or morally sort of unjust in our perhaps meeting in practice for any other sort of practice that harms animals. Um, so I guess, I guess to the extent that you can kind of see that varying in animals, of course I think the thing is, I mean how do we know how much harm an animal experiences? I mean as a psychologist we give people questionnaires, it's very hard to get these creatures to hand, answer questionnaires. So you know I don't, I don't think that we actually have any real you know, real purchase on this idea of what is in an animal's mind. You know, what, what does an animal really think? What does pain feel like to a cockroach? I have absolutely no idea. And is it different to a dog? I don't think I can even answer that question. So I think we have some purchase on it, but I mean, largely it is a very sort of muddy area. Yeah. So I have a question for, for Brock and Chad as well. So Chad, I think you had on one of your last slides there a suggestion for lawmakers to be uh, to acknowledge the role of sentience or that animals can be sentient. But given Brock's research that suggests that when people, um, uh, if anything, when they're going to eat an animal, they attribute less sentience or less mind to an animal, it seems to be a very tricky thing to overcome. So any suggestions from either of you how we can get people to actually acknowledge animals to be sentient? Yeah, I, I think that's a very, very fair comment, and that is the, the challenge. Um, uh, that the law can assist um, by establishing or attempting to establish consistent frameworks, consistent principled frameworks. So um, the respect for sentience being one of the principles that should be uh, applied in a consistent way. But when it comes to um, you know, individual actions and the psychological processes that, that influence their behaviour towards animals, then the law can only you know, guide or, or can only um, influence to a certain extent. Um, so, yeah, it's always going to be a, a real challenge. Did you want to say anything on that? Sure. I, I, I think it's actually got to do with how we see ourselves. Um, and that's, that's fundamentally the kind of the, the, the foundation from which we make these judgments anyway. And so when we see ourselves, you know, as, as Joe mentioned before, as, as higher and as, as of a higher order than other creatures, then we're more likely to sort of diminish the amount of sentience that those creatures have. And, you know, we, we actually can do this even in experimental research showing that framing, for example, humans as animals actually diminishes our perception of an animal's mental capacities, but framing animals as humans increases it. So even just that simple frame switching can change things. So I think it really has a lot to do with how we see ourselves and how we sort of position ourselves in, in, in our ecological environment and, and within the sort of, you know, species, animal species we're a part of, and whether we actually see that that way, if we see ourselves part of that, I think it changes how we see the minds of animals, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on the, the question about um, should there be different levels of um, maybe criminality for different animals and, and thanks Brock for pointing out that how can we ever possibly judge that. I think it's one of the biggest problems with fish and overfishing and why, you know, they're silent screamers and um, we, we can't hear them and the pain that they suffer and how can you say that um, pulling off a grasshopper's leg is any less painful than pulling off a cow, cutting, slicing off a cow's leg or something like that. Um, but in my, my question um, to Jed would be about how um, we haven't, I was surprised to not hear anything about ag laws tonight. 
Um, so I just wondered about how you think they are threatening your progress in bringing in um, these new uh, laws moving forward and getting sentience brought in and stuff. How are the ag gag laws um, stifling your efforts? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the ag gag laws are, in, in my view, very detrimental to um, you know, further progress in animal uh, welfare law reform um, and general community awareness of the way in which um, animals are treated within livestock production systems. Um, Ag-gag may actually link quite well into uh, these processes of, of denial, I, I think, that John was, was talking about as well. But uh, from, a, from a practical policy, policy perspective, um, uh, yeah, ag-gag is something that the, the RSPCA is certainly um, opposed to. I think uh, most or all animal protection organisations are, are, are opposed to ag-gag legislation. Just for those who may not know what ag-gag laws are, they're uh, laws that are being proposed really to target the, the increase in um, animal uh, activist investigations, so the covert investigations to um, document animal cruelty, um, but not, o not only cases of animal cruelty, but, but legal um, sort of husbandry practices within intensive um, animal agricultural systems uh, to publish uh, that those images to the broader public. And there have been some moves at the state and uh, federal level to um, attempt to stifle uh, the ability of animal activists in that area by uh, making it an offence to take um, covert photography and to publish that. Um, uh, and it's based on many different sort of um, labels being privacy, um, biosecurity, um, there's, but at the moment, um, there's only one bill that has been proposed that was in South Australia that has been defeated, but there are a number still in the pipeline. But uh, yeah, for, for general progress in animal welfare, it's detrimental because again, it's shutting the doors and preventing people from, from gaining knowledge on how we are treating animals. But in terms of the denial process, so did you want to um, say anything? John might be able to give comment on how it affects uh, well, I don't have much to add to what Jed said. I, I agree with, with those comments. Um, look, if you think that one of the key issues here is the way that we're putting up barriers in our society to prevent us from fully confronting what's being done to animals in intensive farming, for example, uh, then of course imposing more legal limits on the ability of people to record what's happening on factory farms and make it known to the public is going to be a detrimental thing. Uh, it's one of these forms of cultural uh, rationalisation or um, ethical blind spots that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and for that reason, I think that it should be strongly opposed. the context of globalisation and uh, spread of free trade and trade barriers coming down with TPP and everything, do you think that it's even possible with the push for greater efficiency uh, globally that our reforms in agriculture can even be possible or worthwhile when the possibility of cheaper imports is still there? Or do you think that there needs to be a greater challenge to the logic of the market system and the primacy of efficiency for this to be possible? That's, that's a pretty huge uh, question. Um, in terms of you know, free, free uh, market forces versus other social um, interests and, and causes. Um, just, uh, ag again, a, a practical response. Um, in terms, yes, the, the WTO free trade rules do pose significant challenges um, from an economic sense, being that, um, that the, the rationale is that if Australia um, enacts laws that are going to place extra costs on the production of um, food products here in Australia to increase animal welfare standards, then all of a sudden our market could be flooded with cheap imports from countries that don't use those same standards. And, and it certainly is a, a real threat, um, but I'm very encouraged to see the WTO dispute panels moving in the direc direction where they're uh, starting to legitimise um, animal welfare concerns as being matters um, that can justify a trade barrier. So we, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the, um, the dispute between Canada and the EU in relation to seal products um, uh, was um, 
found to be successful in, the fa in, in favour of the EU, being that the EU banned seal products, uh, the sale of seal, seal products within um, its member states because of the cruelty involved with uh, seal clubbing. Um, and the, uh, the WTO dispute panel upheld that on the basis that that measure was necessary to protect the public morals of EU citizens. So um, I, I think there are promising signs in addressing those uh, free trade issues, but still there's a, a huge amount of work that needs to be done. Um, and, and it requires a significant degree of, of government commitment. If, if government was to impose laws that were going to increase costs for uh, the, the production of our food products, then government would also need to look at measures to um, deal with those issues of cheaper imports flooding the market. The only thing I would add to that uh, quickly is that there, there are two ways you can think about addressing these sorts of issues. And one is through top-down legal regulation and the other is through bottom-up social change. Uh, and I think the sort of issues you've raised shows that there's always going to be limits to legal regulation. Uh, and the only way you're going to have lasting change in this area is if individual consumers change their practices and confront the ethical issues in this context. So no doubt you need a combination of those two things, uh, but the deeper issue of cultural change is crucial. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I think um, we'll wrap up the Q&A. If you could join me in thanking our speakers this evening. Um, I'd, also, I'd also like to thank the University of Queensland for hosting the event, and in particular, Katrina Craig and also Jonathan Crow for their efforts in organising the event. Just quickly, if you want to learn uh, more about Voiceless or the Voiceless Rethinking Seminars, please go to our website. Um, it's www.voiceless.org.au. Um, also, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For um, any law students, lawyers, or legal academics in the audience, you can also um, join our Voiceless Law Talk uh, private group, uh, where you know you'll find all updates on the most up, you know recent legal issues surrounding animal law. Um, until next time, thank you very much for attending.